and I don't know where all the viewers are, are coming from, but I do know hay inventory is a huge issue. And so I'm taking this ruminant nutrition topic and I'm really kind of transforming it into giving or equipping you guys with all the fundamental information pieces that you need to make sure that you're affordably feeding your herd. And so here in the rumen, uh, the ruminant species, there's a few items that I have to really focus in on. What makes her able to transform that old dry fescue hay into meat and milk is the beautiful symbiotic relationship that that cow has with millions of microorganisms within her rumen. And in that room, in that symbiotic relationship, the cow provides the perfect environment, and then the microorganisms provide the digestion, and collectively they, they work in symbiosis. And so in the environment, the cow provides a nice warm 101.5 degree temperature. She also provides nearly 20 gallons of saliva to create the perfect pH, but she also, um, has this giant digestive vat or open space uh, for those microorganisms to reside. And she fuels those bugs with all the feed that she consumes and, and what you manage and put in front of her. And so in exchange, they digest those feedstuffs and develop volatile fatty acids. And so those are long chain uh, fatty acid energy sources that get absorbed by the cow. And that's how she's able to transform grass in the meat and milk. Um, other pieces and parts that I would be negligent to not tell you in a talk that's called ruminant nutrition is the reticulum. And that's gonna be the honeycomb structure that primarily is, is pocketed near the heart of the cow. And um, so the reticulum is where if you install a magnet, that's where your magnet's gonna, gonna sit to prevent hardware disease. Um, that's that's really the, the big role of, of the reticulum is to hold that magnet and, and prevent hardware. And then you've got the omasum is the next phase of digestion or the next chamber. And that's uh, also called normally called mini plies. And so it's almost like a pages in a textbook. And as the feedstuffs go through there, it, it concentrates or absorbs the water, um, concentrates that feedstuff down so that when it goes into the abomasum, that's what we refer to as kind of the true stomach because uh, it's lined with gl glands similar to our monogastric stomach that helps helps the cow go through that that final stage of digestion before it goes into the the small and large intestine and i really want to spend the rest of the time doing a deep dive into what you need to know for boots on the ground when you're feeding your cows and focusing in on that rumen and what fills the rumen because what fills the room in is what's going to allow her to uh, make sure that she's meeting her needs. So let's, let's go through here a little bit. And, and I want you guys to realize that what we're going to focus in on is the nutrient requirements of your beef cow herd. And then we're going to look at what, what does our stored forage provide. And, um, and I'm going to make some inferences for pasture. But because of the, the timing of this talk, I think it's really relevant to talk about those round bales that you're trying to feed your cows and how that forage is gonna provide the needs. And if it doesn't provide your needs, what those deficiencies might be and how we can fill the gap to make sure that your cows are successful for the next few months of stored feed. And so really um, everything that you would ever desire knowing is in, is in this Bible of beef nutrition. And so I, on the right side is, is the dairy cattle nutrient requirement book. And then on the left side of the screen is the, the beef cattle one. Now, everything that you need to know about the most current research associated with feeding your beef herd is going to be found in that book, um, compiled of research-based information. But really, I'm going to have to fly through some of these slides here because fundamentally, we have to understand that we feed those cows ingredients. And those ingredients then fuel the animal with the nutrients that she requires. And there's really six major nutrients or essential nutrients that she needs. And we'll start first with um, protein. Um, um, there we go, crude protein. And crude protein is kind of what I have pictured in this cartoon on the left side. She really doesn't need crude protein 
she needs amino acids. And so um, when we analyze our hay test, we're looking at the, at the crude protein concentrations in that feedstuff. Um, but really what we, what we wanna know is those building blocks of protein uh, is what she truly requires. And then we've got carbohydrates as our source of energy. We can also get energy from fat, but be delicate with feeding fat. Uh, be aware, just know that even though it's 2.25 times more concentrated than carbohydrates in, in excess, it can be toxic to those microorganisms. Um, we also need vitamins and minerals. And, and for those of you astute students, you're counting the bullets there. There's only five. So which, which is the most important nutrient uh, that we often kind of glaze over, but really shouldn't forget about in the, in the deep cold winter days, that would of course be water, right? Um, and so water is incredibly important in driving intake. And if she doesn't have enough water, then she's not going to eat and that's never gonna be good. Um, and I also put in here a slide and I know it's hard to think about it today. Uh, down here in Southwest Missouri, we've got snow uh, but if you focus in there on the temperature differential um, and how much water consumption changes based on her needs, that, um, that lactating cow sees an increase of nearly 42% more water required uh, when it's hot outside, right? And so keep that in mind um, as, as we address these topics across the calendar year, um, in addition to just what we have currently. So... I employ this picture from 1988 uh, because it still does a fantastic job kind of encapsulating what, what your cows need, right? And there in the top uh, left corner, you can see we've got the diet that she consumes is going to then fuel her first metabolism. So keeping that cow alive, is she breathing, creating lung tissue, creating hair, um, just metabolism of that animal, right? And basic, basic needs. And then once the basic needs are met in that metabolism, then we go towards, towards growth and, and increasing body mass. And that's gonna be in the form of primarily muscle and structural growth. And then beyond that, if we have extra, we're gonna add to body condition or that subcutaneous fat over the body of the animal. Um, and then comes lactation. But notice that lactation comes before your estrus and reproduction. And so what we know is that she will not cycle if you're not be meeting her basic needs. And it's kind of the idea of the, the barrel and stave approach. She will only perform based on what you provide her. And so if, if she doesn't have the needs met, she won't reproduce. And so I know that's something that a lot of folks in, that have a fall calving herd might be thinking about right now, uh, because we need to make sure that she has the energy and the nutrients required to be reproductively successful. And to kind of snap shoot, uh, give a snapshot of that, this, this animal that's in peak lactation, lactation is a very demanding period of time for the animal. And so she's gonna need very high level or plane of nutrition. And, you know, those of you that are running stalker calves that are, are averaging two to four pounds per day, uh, he's going to need quite a bit to build that meat and muscle uh, and structural growth. And then your, your mature dam that has a, a calf that is already going on to creep, that's less reliant on mama, that cow needs less because her lactation is less. Um, and then our lowest requirement is going to be that dry cow. And so the reason why I, I draw attention to these classes of cattle is it's incredibly important to understand what their needs are so that then we can identify uh, the requirements within, within your herd. So to look at that a little more pictorially, I always get a bit nervous about putting specific requirements on a, on a table because it really depends. You have, you have nutrient requirement changes or increases based on the amount of mud that you have on their flanks, right? And so I, I hesitate. I think you should talk to your livestock nutrition specialists throughout the state to help guide your, your metric. But in general, 
This 1300 pound uh, beef cow that has superior milking ability in a spring calving system, you can easily see here on the Y axis is the amount of energy. And on the X axis is the time on the calendar relative to when she gives birth. So here in the, in the far left corner of, of the graph is gonna be the day she gives birth. And you can see two months into it is when she hits peak lactation. And that goes back to the understanding that lactation or those dark green bars is really what drives the energy requirements of your, of your beef and dairy herd, right? Um, a lot of times we like to think about when she's big and pregnant and that feed is taking a lot. But if you notice there in, the, in that, last, that, that last bar, when she's not lactating and all she's doing is focusing on that gestating fetus, if you draw a line over, the requirements are significantly less than that of when she's an open cow in peak lactation. You see, and so that, that kind of plays, plays with your mind a little bit, but understanding that fundamental deal there will help you know how to deliver the appropriate hay bundles to the appropriate herd, right? Um, if we look at it for for a first calf heifer, it's exactly the same, but you notice we have to tack growth on, on top, of, on top of that. And so that growth bar just tacks on the top and she has to grow before she can be successful in those, in those other classes, such as lactation and getting pregnant again. Um, and so those first calf heifers can be really challenging. And if there was one recommendation that you walk away from this knowing, if you change nothing else in your operation, consider separating out those mature cows from your first calf heifers in the opportunity to customize how you feed that, that class of animals that is still growing because they need their needs are so much different than your mature herd. And so take that into consideration. Um, let's see. So I think another fundamental thing that I failed to mention in the last slide that I really want to focus in here, you can see between months seven and eight, a big change of, of lactation, that lactation bar goes away, right? And that's, of course, when you're, you're weaning that calf off. And consider when you have limited feed resources, perhaps, may, maybe, talk to your livestock specialist, but maybe you could consider early weaning in order to amplify her reproductive potential um, when, when feed resources are low. So um, all of those are different nuances that you can manipulate and manage so that you can manage a profitable herd. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the needs of, of the cows, and I know I'm going super fast, but 30 minutes is really short, and I, and I know it's going to be recorded, so you can re rewind. Um, but we've talked about the needs of your herd, and now we need to talk about the forage resources that you have available. And so when we talk about forage nutrients, really the concept, the concepts, the fundamental concepts are the same, whether you're grazing or if you're harvesting hay. And so when you're thinking about this uh, for the upcoming hay season, or if you can reflect back on your last hay season, season you can kind of recall what stage your forages were in and that will help you understand what, what challenges you might have when you go to feed that bale of hay, right? And so the, the ideal time, I, I have to put this picture in there because the ideal time is to somewhere balance between quality versus quantity. And this is always the risk and you, and you never know um, weather events sometimes dictate this, but in the perfect world, you would have that beautiful balance between where, where quality is the highest and quantity is the highest. And that's, that's when you capture, capture your stored feed, right? Um, and or graze, because uh, that's the maximum or opportunity. But sometimes uh, here on the far right side of the screen, you can see sometimes that grass gets away from us, right? And we harvest uh, fescue at a, a full seed head, um, well past boot, uh, boot stage being when that seed emerges. And, um, and we just have to, we have to, we have to feed what we have, but understanding 
how that um, forage is generated, understanding that is going to be, is going to help you be more effective. And so I've got this snapshot of what a cell wall looks like. And so the outside of the cell wall is where the fiber is stored. And if I just in general, this screen shows, you can imagine in, in April, that lush vegetative fescue, as you walk through it, it even streaks your, your genes with green. And what that green is, is those cell solubles rupturing open and, uh, and, and that's where all the good stuff is. But if you fast forward and go into summer months, the fescue plant goes reproductive, right? And that's when the fiber concentrations increase substantially. And what's happening there is as it goes reproductive, it's trying to get that seed head up so that the, so that the forage can replicate or reproduce, right? But what we're seeing actually happen in that plant cell is the, the cell solubles decrease. And the cell solubles is where all the good stuff is. That's where the, the sugars and the proteins and the starches and the pectins, everything that fuels the cow primarily is found inside of that cell soluble. But luckily, because of those microorganisms, she can take some of the fiber in the cell wall and digest it down and make energy out of that. But, um, but it limits intake because it's, it's bulky. And so when she consumes a, uh, a high fiber feed, it will fill the rumen full. She's only able to eat about 1.2% of her total body weight in NDF or neutral detergent fiber. And that neutral detergent fiber is the hemicellulose and the cellulose that builds the, the structure of that plant cell wall, right? And so the first step when we go to analyze your forage, because you, you all are going to run out and take a hay test and go take it to your favorite uh, analysis location. Um, and they're going to tell you how much NDF or neutral detergent fiber is, is present. And that's going to tell you how much she is physically capable of eating before that rumen vat, that digestive vat inside your cow fills full, right? And what we need to know from that number is once it's full, will that meet her needs or will she still have not enough? Because you can have a, a cow that is completely full, but still deficient from her needs. And that's an important take home to understand is being full yet empty in her needs creates a bad situation for your herd. So anywho, so NDF is gonna control intake and then uh, the, the lab will analyze it further down and determine the ADF. And that's gonna be the, the portion of the plant that is truly indigestible or shakes out the, the sulfuric acid will shake out the lignin portion, which is, which is truly indigestible. Um, and that's, that's how we're gonna know what, what she's capable of what those microorganisms are capable of you utilizing, right? Okay, I tell you what, this is this is awkward. I can't tell from that little video whether you guys are getting it or not. Uh, but next year we'll be able to see each other, I'm sure. Uh, okay, so anyway, here's an example of a few different hay tests that are available uh, from a local lab here in Southwest Missouri. And we there's two different analyses. You've got the, um, Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate the feedback. Um, we have um, super high quality queen of forages alfalfa that is super digestible and look at all of those different nutrients available to it. Um, you can do alfalfa wrong too, don't get me wrong, uh, but that's, that's a fairly nice test. Uh, you know, the queen of forages all the way down to fescue aftermath when you're, when you're taking the seed and you've got nothing but coarse, lignified, high fiber uh, feed, right? And so this kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, you can have similar results to that fescue aftermath just by harvesting maybe for the first time in late June. Um, it would get you the exact same thing and maybe even a little bit of extra toxins from the seed head. Uh, point of the story is that um, 
the way you put up hay is going to directly impact the success or failure of your herd. But these are some benchmarks here to give you an idea. Make sure you consider when you're talking to your, um, your hay analysis lab that um, you can do a wet analysis or you can do an NIR or a near infrared spec. And so that NIR now recently has, um, has gained in popularity. It's a lot more affordable. And depending on your lab, will likely be very accurate, good enough for, for your beef herd and only cost 20 bucks. It'll be the best uh, $20 bill you've ever spent. So again, kind of rewinding back a little bit, when you have a lot of cell wall, so over on the right-hand side, you, um, sorry, over on the right-hand side, early June, chances are you've got really low protein um, and my numbers on the bottom of the screen, you gotta swap them, right? Really low protein, or low cell solubles means that you have a high amount of fiber and so she can consume less of her total body weight um, overall. But general rules of thumb, about a one and a half percent of her total body weight in NDF when protein is, is low and you can consume as much as two and a half percent or more of, of the body weight when protein is very lush or the, the cell wall is very lush and digestible. Um, I know I've got everybody squirming because I've got three minutes left. And so I'm going to have to go through these really fast. Uh, but you can estimate intake. And in general, we know that dry matter intake will go down when NDF goes up, right? And these are some, some general uh, analyses for percent NDF. Um, and this 1,200-pound uh, mama cow that has superior milking quality. An example of what her requirements would be is right there at that upper upper graph. And so if we were to uh, harvest that forage in the vegetative state or very digestible, if we compare that to the mature state, or if we harvest that hay, not very digestible, and we look at that, you can compare and contrast that that vegetative state hay, or if you're grazing when it's lush and juicy, it's going to meet exactly what she needs, actually exceed it. She's going to do swell with only grass, right? But if you grab that hay or if you capture that, that forage and store it past maturity, um, then it's not going to meet her needs and we're going to have to supplement. And so when we need to supplement, we have to take on some considerations that most of the time energy is going to be the limiting factor. Sometimes protein is to do your hay analysis, right? But a lot of the energy resources that you can have are going to be primarily starch based. And so be aware of that. Uh, you also have soy holes that are a fibrous base um, energy source. But, but know that if you choose to feed a starch based energy source to supplement or fill the gap, that it could impact your rumen digestibility. So Again, talk to your livestock specialist to make sure that that's, that's gonna work out and you're not limiting your intake. All of this is encapsulated. If you take a screenshot real quick, all of this is encapsulated. Um, and I think some, some details that I cannot possibly, I can't possibly have a nutrition talk and not talk about some mandatory comments such as always monitor your body condition score. That's gonna be an excellent indicator over time of if you're hitting the mark or not. Um, and you can also, of course, uh, monitor your manure and know that, for example, that one in the top left corner, when it stacks like a wedding cake, uh, that means that your, your feed is gonna be high in fiber and could be an indicator that it might not be meeting her needs. Uh, whereas we all know the, the spring lush juicy on the bottom right. Um, in conclusion, because I know we're getting short on time, I know that anytime you can feed your herd, the simpler, the better. Um, most of the time that means more money stays in your pocket, right? But the, the critical thing that you have to learn from out of all of this is that you have to know what you're feeding. Um, you've done the best that you can to put up that hay as well as possible. Now you need to know what it provides your herd so that you can fill the gap if you need to. And if you don't need to, 
don't. That'll help save your, your cash flow uh, going forward. And so just realize that ruminant nutrition doesn't really happen. It doesn't just happen. It is a specific choice of, of management that you create. And so be empowered by that and know that, that you can be successful. Um, last but not least, I just want to I want to thank you for your time. 